Tonda Brown O'Connor Distinguished Lecture, Speaking of Social Justice, featuring author Jeff Hobbs. My name is Alan Detloff. I'm the dean and the inaugural Maconda Brown O'Connor Endowed Dean's Chair of the Graduate College of Social Work. This endowment that supports both my position as dean and this lecture series was established in 2014 by the Brown Foundation on behalf of the family of Dr. Maconda Brown O'Connor, a social worker, an advocate for children, and a very generous philanthropist. This gift was a transformative gift for the Graduate College of Social Work, as it set our college apart as one of the few schools of social work in the country with an endowed dean's chair, and it created a permanent, permanent fund for our college to further our research and foster excellence in the profession of social work. I'm very appreciative to the O'Connor family for their generosity and for all they've done for the Graduate College of Social Work. In my first year as dean, I had the opportunity to lead the college in the development of our first ever strategic plan that focuses on both our national competitiveness and our student success. And as the first step in the development of this plan, we established the vision and the mission for our college that will take us into the future. As we began this process, we realized that our college has had a mission statement that describes what we do and how we do it for many years, but we've never in our history had a vision statement. And for us, the vision statement was about why we do what we do. Not to think about the what or the how, but to think about the why. Why do we exist as a college of social work? And the obvious answer to that is because there's a need for social workers in our community. But why is there such a need for social workers? And we realize that there's a need for social workers in our community because we continue to live in a society where there is injustice, where there is not equity in opportunities and equality of outcomes. So what we do what we do because we want to be part of creating a more just society. So the vision for our college is to achieve social, racial, economic, and political justice for all. And everything we do now revolves around that goal. And as a result, we established the Dean's Summer Social Justice students, to our faculty, to our alumni, to our community partners, in reading a work that raises awareness of some of the most challenging issues facing our society and sparks the conversations to achieve real and lasting change. And this past summer, the work we chose was The Short and Tragic Life of Robert Peace, a brilliant young man who left Newark for the Ivy League. And today, we're very honored to welcome the author of that book, New York Times bestselling author Jeff Hobbs, for our second annual Speaking of Social Justice, Maconda Brown O'Connor Distinguished Lecture. Jeff Hobbs grew up in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, and received a BA in English Language and Literature from Yale University in 2002, where he won the Meeker Prize and the Gardner Millet Award for his writing. His first novel, The Tourists, was published in 2007 by Simon & Schuster and was a national bestseller. His first work of nonfiction, The Short and Tragic Life of Robert Peace, was published in 2014 by Scribner and was a New York Times bestseller, Amazon's number four best book of the year, and a notable book of the year selection by The New York Times, The Washington Post, and NPR. His September 2014 interview with Steve Inskeep for NPR's Morning Edition was one of the five most shared stories of the week. And we're very honored that Jeff Hobbs is with us tonight to speak about this incredible and moving story. Following Mr. Harb's remarks, we'll have a brief period of questions and answers, and then we'll move to a reception upstairs in the multi-purpose room where copies of his book will be available. I know all of you are very proficient social media users, so if you want to tweet or post about tonight, use hashtag SpeakSocialJustice. And now, please help me welcome Jeff Hobbs. Uh, th thank you, Dean Detloff and Ms. Butler and Ms. Warren and uh, everyone here and all of you for uh, coming out on a Thursday night um, after a very exciting Wednesday night. I actually, uh, I got here last night uh, in time for the last three innings and I actually came from our home about three blocks from Dodger Stadium. Um, <laughs> But I was a, I was a sort of, I couldn't tell the neighborhood this, but I was rooting for the Astros the whole time. Um, um, I'm not just saying that, uh, nor am I just saying that I'm humbled to be here just because I'm here. I'm actually humbled to be here uh, speaking to people who uh, not just want to, but can do the hard work uh, the good work, the, the work that I just write about. Um, 
humbling indeed. It is a privilege to speak to anybody about Rob Peace, uh, but especially teachers and students. Rob was a special student, and he was a he was a very good teacher too. Um, and uh, speaking with regards to his story and justice, uh, even more meaningful because justice was something that uh, threaded through his life, justice and injustice. Uh, Rob was my uh, roommate, um, good friend for four years of college at Yale. Um, he bailed me out of fistfights, <clears throat> which was good because I didn't know how to be in one of those. Um, and he eased me through heartbreak, uh, which was also good because I didn't know much about girls. And uh, I still don't, even though I've been married to one for 12 years. Um, but mostly we, we sat around a, a pretty messy little room and talked about, uh, uh, about sports and, and food and music and uh, girls and things. Um, after college, uh, he was a groomsman in my wedding and uh, sort of a touchstone through young adulthood. Um, after I got married, he and I lived on different coasts and we uh, talked on the phone four or five times a year. Uh, again, not about very much because unfortunately we are guys. Uh, but the conversations were genuine and, and we made the effort to have them and it seemed like life was long and there would always be time for a reunion. Uh, there wasn't time because uh, about six years ago, uh, right before his 31st birthday, Rob was shot twice and killed uh, by men in ski masks. Uh, this happened in a basement filled with marijuana that Rob had been selling about a mile from the house he'd grown up in. Uh, and I could tell you a lot about how and where Rob grew up in a neighborhood outside Newark, New Jersey, nicknamed Illtown. Uh, his mother working very long hours for, for not much money, mostly in hospital and nursing home kitchens. Uh, his father, who was arrested and later convicted of a double murder when Rob was seven years old, a uh, neighborhood where Rob playing football with his friends. Uh, they were not witnessing violence or being assaulted every day. It was very rare, but they knew that on any day it could happen, and so they had to sort of be uh, on their guard at all times. Rob called this Newark proofing himself. And uh, I don't want to belabor the description. It was a it was a rough neighborhood, um, as almost everyone who grew up there told me at some point. Uh, it was not Disneyland, but it was home. And Rob really loved his home and the people there. Uh, I met him first day, freshman year. We were randomly paired together. Uh, we met with an awkward head nod, hand slap. Uh, uh, what's up? Do you know where we can get some food? Uh, at the time, I just knew that he had gone to prep school. Uh, he played water polo, and he enjoyed hiking the Appalachian Trail with his friends. I assumed that aside from being black, he, he was a pretty typical Yale freshman. And progressive people might wonder if there is such a thing, and I, I promise you there, there is. Uh, you're, you're looking at you're looking at one, not, not a freshman anymore, but uh, I once was. Uh, Rob was not typical, and not just because of uh, how and where he'd grown up. He was not typical because he was a straight-A student in molecular biophysics and biochemistry, which is about as easy as it sounds. Uh, he was captain of the water polo team for, for two years and uh, very popular. He was in a secret society, which is a yell thing I won't uh, bother you with. Uh, he had a group of girls who uh, would come rebraid his cornrows on call, uh, which took about three hours. And, and I remember a lot of 
uh, talk and laughter while they were doing that. He smoked a lot of marijuana. He sold marijuana. Um, he was not quiet about it, certainly registered with me. Uh, it seemed like since he never spent any money on himself and uh, uh, he must be saving up for grad school or, or just building a safety net that he'd never had before. And since it was uh, something maybe he could do and, and maybe even he needed to do, and, and since we uh, are talking about marijuana in a college dorm, it seemed safe if, if nothing else. Every night he hung up the phone with his mom and said the words, you're my heart. Uh, and none of this uh, represents a typical Yaley or a typical college student. Uh, at the time, I, I, I was pretty glad to have a black roommate. Uh, I considered myself pretty cool when it came to black culture. Uh, this is because I ran track uh, in high school. Um, in, in fact, when I was a junior, I ran in the Junior Olympics uh, here at the University of Houston. I walked around the, the stadium today, um, and uh, you know, my, my teammates taught me how to play spades, and we listened to Nas, and they, they called me an honorary black man. Uh, so I, I thought I was down, um, which, uh, you know, Rob never clued me in otherwise, I, I think more out of amusement than uh, any other social constructs. Uh, but it's painful when you're my age to learn how ignorant you were. Um, as a kid, it's painful, it's also valuable. Uh, I also consider myself very aware. Uh, I always wanted to be a writer. I, I thought I paid attention to the big and the small things, and I, I was aware of, of um, everything I've mentioned about Rob so far. Uh, what I was not aware of was the huge and complicated set of uh, discomforts that he dealt with moving from his home to uh, college, to Yale, uh, how to reconcile the gratitude. Uh, he had very real gratitude for this gift of, of a good education. It was actually a gift a, a rich white banker alum of his high school uh, saw a speech he gave and offered to pay his tuition on the spot. How, how to reconcile that with also very real resentment of blithely affluent classmates like me. How to manage the guilt knowing uh, his mother was home crying every night the first uh, semester he was away and she, she was alone in that house on Chapman Street for the first time since Rob was born. Uh, how to manage the guilt for high school friends, also very bright guys who couldn't go to college for financial or other reasons. How to avert the vitriol uh, that others back home would target him with because since he had chosen to go to Yale, it must mean he thought he was better than them. How to ask for help without admitting that he needed it. Uh, and here I risk maybe painting the picture of a brooding Hamlet figure sort of trudging around campus uh, in his leather jacket scowling at people. And that was not Rob. Uh, he was happy, he, he was a bright, light, he, uh, he was very popular. Um, he had a high-pitched laugh and he laughed all the time. Uh, he made fantastic friendships in college, lifelong friendships, uh, and he carried those with him. Any friction he dealt with, he dealt with it invisibly and all but alone, uh, and he carried that with him too. Uh, and because we didn't see it, uh, and also because we uh, fawned over him as, as this sort of iconic guy uh, when we watched him receive his diploma in the spring of 2002. He seemed not just destined, but maybe even chosen to fulfill all of his dreams and all the dreams others had for him. Uh, and he accomplished 
a lot. He, he, he was a high school teacher in Newark, and, uh, and he traveled the world, and, and he took care of a lot of people. Uh, but he uh, didn't really align with, with sort of the blueprint that, uh, that his Yale diploma promised. And almost nine years after we graduated, uh, I was brushing my teeth next to my wife and uh, trying not to wake up her little girl. And, and the phone dinged, and I learned he, he had died uh, violently uh, in a drug-related incident. And uh, that's all I learned at the time. And about six months after that, I found myself in Rob's mother, Jackie's, living room uh, on Chapman Street, uh, talking to her about telling her son's story in, in some form. And the reason I was there had to do with the funeral a few days after he died, uh, where alongside the uh, towering grief uh, over 400 people from all over the world and uh, a particular kind of grief that I'd never experienced before, uh, being a sheltered guy. And alongside the many people outside that church who seemed almost uh, gleeful to call him a, a you know, petty thug and, and a cliche of squandered potential, uh, anonymous strangers on, on the internet, of course. And, and alongside all, all the terrible questions, the, biggest of which was why and what happened, how did we not know, uh, how could we not stop it. Um, alongside all that was actually just a lot of storytelling uh, and actually a lot of laughter. Uh, we did, as the day progressed through, through you know, many sad events and, and ended up at a bar uh, pretty slashy uh, later in the afternoon, uh, we, we did what people have done for all of history in times of joy and in times of mourning. We just told stories about his kindness and his uh, generosity and his quirks, uh, the way he would crack every single joint in his body at the same time, which was really gross. Um, and we all went home from the funeral and we sort of kept sharing stories um, on Facebook, on the phone, in person. Uh, people just didn't want to let this guy go. And at a certain point, I volunteered uh, foolishly, I guess, to maybe uh, make a compilation of some of these stories and talk to some people and, and maybe try to write, like, say, a thousand-word eulogy of some kind for the Yale magazine or his high school newsletter, something nobody would read but maybe could reside in his mother's attic and maybe speak to his life and character and not just his death. Uh, and, and so that's how I ended up uh, visiting Jackie Peace around Thanksgiving. Um, I was very nervous showing up at her home, thinking maybe just invoking her son's name would cause her more pain, uh, which of course it did, and I did. Uh, and I was expecting a shattered woman. Um, but she wasn't, at least not outwardly. She was very gracious, and, and she smiled a lot and laughed a few times. Uh, I expressed maybe my uncertainty with the whole thing, uh, the fact that I, uh, it would be difficult to publish, you know, even a small little thing that, that was so sad and so hard uh, that I had never done any nonfiction, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, the fact that uh, I looked the way I look, uh, that was one of the times she laughed. Uh, she said, I'm sitting here, I, I, I know you're white. Um, uh, later on, she expressed uh, that she had been very wary of sending her son to Yale because uh, she didn't want him to be surrounded by snobs, which uh, very valid concern when you're talking about Yale. Uh, I asked her if she had thought I was a snob when we first met. And she paused for a pretty conspicuous uh, amount of time 
and said, I'm sure I thought you were a nice boy. Um, and in the end, she didn't even think about it that much. She just said, uh, that'd be nice. Um, I think she was moved that people still cared. Uh, and that is how uh, I ended up spending what turned into uh, almost four years sort of stumbling around Newark, New Jersey, uh, talking to people in their stoops and their uh, their kitchens and their cars and their offices, uh, gathering the story. And, uh, you know, as uh, I expected to talk to maybe six or eight family and friends and everyone I spoke to, uh, Rob had a lot of friends, so everyone just said, well, now you have to talk to my cousin, who used to play Monopoly with Rob, and this uh, kid that he taught at the high school, and this girl he messed with once, and um, and uh, six people turned into 60, and 80, and 100, and 1,000 words turned into over 1,000 pages of, of um, interview transcripts, and uh, the eulogy got a little out of hand. And as that happened, uh, a lot of very serious questions that, uh, that maybe we all contend with uh, started to come up, in my brain anyway. Um, these are questions I, I still contend with now, about six years later. Um, biggest one is, is why? What, what's, the, what's the point? Uh, why would, what's the value of, of telling a uh, really sad story when there are so many positive, inspiring, triumphant stories out there. Uh, also, uh, what would Rob think of this? He, he was a pretty private guy, uh, particularly when it came to things like his father and, and his family. Um, what would Rob think of me doing it, uh, me sort of participating in this uh, apparatus by which the vast majority of stories in this country are told by overeducated, uh, overprivileged white men? Um, I, I bet he would be pretty pissed off. Um, and it wasn't fun when he was pissed off at you, uh, I remember. Um, and also, what is justice for Rob Peace? Uh, is there justice? Do, does, he, does he merit the effort to gain justice? What does that word mean in this context? Um, I remember a, a few years ago, I was speaking at a uh, place called Hampton University, which is a uh, historically black university, uh, beautiful um, at Hampton Roads wonderful college, uh, and at a certain point, a young man stood up, and, and he wasn't hostile, but, but he was very serious, and, and he was definitely uh, giving me the stink eye, and he, he said, what, what is the point of this? Why am I here? Why are you here in your tie telling me that uh, there is a positive message in this story of a black man who was born with so many gifts and given so many gifts, and he died because he sold drugs. Uh, and I, I stammered a, a little bit. Uh, I was uncomfortable. And uh, what I've learned in, in these last few years is that it's OK to be uncomfortable. It's actually uh, pretty valuable to be uncomfortable. And uh, I was uncomfortable a lot during all, all, all these hundreds of hours I spent with uh, people in Rob's orbit and uh, sharing stories. Like the funeral, most of these stories involved laughter and, and, uh, and generosity and, and strangeness and uh, uh, love. A um, uh, few of them also involved patterns that are more troubling patterns that involved recklessness and uh, confrontation and, and drugs, these patterns that uh, that Rob hid very well and that didn't uh, become clear until it was too late. Uh, and I, it started to occur to me that the reason they didn't become clear 
uh, had to do with Rob and, and his privacy and compartmentalization, but it also had to do with us and the fact that uh, most of these stories ended with the same words, uh, which were Rob was the man, peace was the man, Rob, peace was the man. And uh, uh, Rob would agree with that himself, and, and he owned that and projected that and, and fostered that. But uh, we all, as we talked, started to realize that you can get so accustomed to seeing someone through the lens of being, say, the man, that you can forget that uh, he's also a man, uh, a person who, a man who uh, experiences anxiety and, and insecurity and, and, and doubt. Uh, even a man like Rob, who uh, moved with fluidity through so many different uh, environments and influences. Uh, one of these influences was Rob's father, uh, who again went, went to prison when Rob was seven years old. I remember speaking to his father. Uh, a lot of times he, he would call the dorm room uh, and if Rob was there, I'd give him the phone. If Rob was not there, I, I would leave a message. It was still the days of, of whiteboards on, uh, on doorways. I, I miss those days. Um, and I remember his dad's voice, and he was always very gracious. And I also remember, you know, I knew where he was, but nothing more. And, and I always wanted to ask Rob and uh, just, just get to know more. And, and uh, I didn't because... Uh, it just seemed like it would be a hard conversation to have. Uh, and because of that, I, I conflated Rob's loss with so many other forms of loss, and, and I just figured that uh, it's hard, but people are strong, and they move on, and it's best just not to uh, bring it up. Uh, what I didn't know was that Rob never moved on from the loss of his dad, and that in beginning at age seven, he visited his father in, in jail and then prison uh, every week, every, every two weeks, uh, every three weeks, whenever he possibly could. And beginning at age 13, without telling anybody, Rob began spending his free time in... Uh, in the city law library, researching precedents and, and Sixth Amendment law, uh, just just gunning up and, and devoting a lot of his time and a whole lot of his spirit to freeing his father, who he firmly believed was innocent. Um, knowing the things I know now, it's hard to say with his he was wrong, um, but you can't litigate the case. What I can say without contestation is that his father did not receive a fair trial because his father did not have money. And so his father did not get justice. That is something Rob carried with him. Um, whatever he and his father spoke about through plexiglass uh, over the 20 years his father spent in prison before he died in prison of brain cancer. Um, nobody will ever know that they, those words reside as they should in the same plot in a Rosedale Cemetery where, where the two men are buried together. I imagine they talked a lot about the New York Giants. Uh, I bet they talked a lot about popular music of the day and uh, some about school and, and prospects, and I bet they talked a bit about girls, uh, um, and a little bit maybe about manhood and what it means to be a man and success and what it means to be successful and uh, what it means to be fulfilled and what it means to be loyal, what it means to be real, what it means to be black. Um, all very difficult words because these words mean 
uh, such different things depending on your experience. And, uh, you know, I, I bet those two guys parsed through that as much as they could in the time they were allotted. Uh, and, and it's maybe a zone where uh, what I do and, and what you all do uh, can nourish each other, which is language. I, I can't think of many things that I feel are more important when it comes to all forms of justice than language and the, the beauty of that language and the appreciation of it and, and the nuance and, and uh, the dialogue that can occur between two people when, um, when each person is thinking about not just what their words mean to themselves, but what they mean to the other, uh, particularly in this era where a lot of the loudest voices uh, uh, sound out in social media, echo chambers, and the pre-thoughts that are tweets. Uh, I'm biased because I write books for, for uh, my life, so uh, end of self-righteous digression. Um, uh, another really important environment was Rob's High School. I, I think very important to your work and studies. St. Benedict's, a Jesuit school in downtown Newark. Uh, an old school, red brick, small building. Teachers are, uh, not all of them, but, but the, the funnest ones are these old monks in dark robes with white beards and spectacles. And, and the students are uh, from all over the city, 90% black and Latino students, a lot of them from poverty, a lot more from families fractured by uh, abandonment and imprisonment and, and death. Um, the school sort of functions via an authoritarian control over what they view as the student's most valuable commodity, which is their time. So sports, extracurriculars, extra help. Uh, they just try to keep kids in the school. These are kids who have grown up a lot faster than uh, they deserve. But they're still kids, boys. Um, again, their interests are, are in music and, and playing and dating. And uh, when Rob entered the school as a freshman in 1994, he was a pretty skinny, uh, pretty shy, pretty nerdy kid. Um, he was known mainly for having read Faulkner and Twain for fun in middle school, uh, and also for having memorized all the lyrics to all the songs by Bone Thugs and Harmony, uh, which, which is a pretty serious endeavor. Um, when he graduated four years later, uh, he was uh, a swimming star, and. Um, 4.0 GPA and, and uh, Yale bound and uh, leader of the student government and a leader of men. And he went from St. Benedict's to Yale from, from a very uh, loving and contained space to a space that uh, I would definitely say is cloistered, but uh, is liberal in its attitude towards students and their time and what they do with their time. Um, and Rob went to Yale not just as his families and his neighborhoods and his school's hero, but also as society's hero, um, the kind of story, very particular narrative that uh, uh, this is what is possible when, when you give a young man a opportunity and give him some money. And it's the kind of story that, uh, again, may, makes people who look like me feel, feel really good and feel like we live in a, in a just country and, and yay, America. Uh, and Rob Candle carried that mantle uh, very easily, it seemed. He, he didn't run from it or seem to have a problem with it, but uh, it also meant that any decision he made that didn't align with a, 
again, the very specific blueprint of that narrative uh, carried a larger magnitude of judgment on that decision. And judgment, whether it takes place in academia or <coughs> in a marriage or, or at work, uh, judgment means alienation. Uh, at Yale, uh, you know, they, they were marginally helpful with, with research uh, uh, when I was there. Definitely more guarded than any drug dealer in, in downtown Newark, New Jersey. Um, but one of the most troubling things I learned there, uh, troubling because I was totally ignorant of this, uh, was it had to do with help. Uh, because Yale, um, University of Houston, uh, so many schools I've been to and, and any institution uh, has some deeply rooted infrastructure to provide help to its students. There are writing tutors and counselors and career services. Um, and th these things are typically geared toward students who uh, you know, face steeper transitions and more obstacles. And what I learned is the students who by far are more likely to take advantage of these resources are, uh, um, I mean, not just the Rhodes Scholars trying to turn a A minus paper into an A plus. Uh, it, it, it's a more complicated conversation because uh, everyone I spoke to about it, it, it transcends class and race. Um, it's the kids who from the first day of their lives were geared to believe that adults exist to help them. And I'm not knocking that. I mean, one thing I, I say, especially to high schoolers, is that high school and college, it's the last time in your life when uh, you're surrounded by adults whose life's purpose is to help you. So, so let them fulfill their life's purpose. It makes them very happy. Uh, but then you have a, a guy like Rob who, from age seven, when he lost his dad, had to see himself as a functioning adult, and uh, he, he saw the, even the simplest act of help, like sitting down with a friend and letting them listen as uh, not just an expression of weakness, but uh, even a source of shame. And Rob was also very skilled at hiding, uh, as I mentioned earlier, feelings like need and, and, and fear and stress. Uh, Newark proofing. And a lot of young people have that skill because they have to, to sort of stay safe and, and carry on. And uh, the purpose of being here, writing this book, is not to suggest that anybody who, who has that skill or, or feels out of place in, in school is, is going to uh, uh, you know, be isolated like Rob or, or make decisions like he made. Um, I, I, I spoke to dozens and dozens of former classmates who, who shared threads, overcame obstacles similar to Rob. Um, remembers the, the stress of poverty and, and uh, single parent homes and, and just living in the city and, and uh, all of them are, are living uh, I mean, I mentioned success is a tricky word, but sort of the, the baseline American version of success. These uh, friends all own homes and, and have families that they support with jobs that they like. Uh, and yet every single one of these people, uh, once the subject came up through talking about Rob, they began to express this trauma of isolation that still trails them 15, uh, more than 15 years after graduating college. The uh, exhaustion and depletion of, of having to be grateful all the time, uh, grateful for every office hours with a professor and 
uh, financial aid check that clears and, and every time a classmate invites you home for a holiday that you can't afford to get to your own home for <coughs> um, and fear of every lapse in that gratefulness that might s people might start calling you a whiner or something and uh, uh, I think culturally we are blind to that I, I think most people in the majority feel like uh, they should be grateful why wouldn't they be I, I was certainly blind to it myself in the sense that uh, I was friends with a lot of these people and I had no idea they were uh, stressed and the reason I didn't is because they did not want me to because if I did it might signal somehow that they did not belong and uh, uh, belonging is pretty important especially when you're young uh, and so I, I visited a lot of colleges and, and high schools uh, juvenile halls Ivy League schools state schools vocational schools uh, HBCUs, uh, prep schools, uh, and in conclusion, I, I thought it might be worthwhile to share uh, some of the things I've observed uh, in bringing this story to a lot of places and a lot of people uh, and patterns that, uh, you know, arise in predictable and unpredictable ways, uh, according to them the space that, that we're in. I would say that in, uh, in prep schools and, and more affluent high schools, uh, independent schools, uh, when, when we have these conversations, uh, the students struggle a little bit um, talking about Rob because they want to make it make more sense, they want to uh, read the book and draw clean lines from A to B to C and say, say, uh, this is what happened. This is why it happened. This is the, uh, uh, this is the uptake. And uh, you know, you, you can sort of do that if you curve the lines a little bit. Uh, but it's a leap for some of these students to. Uh, start to think about the bubbles we live in, not the obvious bubbles of privilege and institutions, but the individual bubbles of, uh, of our own homes and, and the thousands of moments that have formed us uh, for them to see that we all don't experience each moment in the same way and to understand that it is messy being a person and having a consciousness and values, often conflicting values that we use to make decisions. A pretty valuable leap, I think. Um, in uh, city schools, public schools, uh, at-risk groups, uh, and it's tough to witness at-risk groups being called at-risk to their faces, uh, but, but that's a thing. Um, but there, it's pretty, uh, those are good experiences. Uh, teenagers are cool because they, they, uh, they don't hide what they think of you, even if they're not saying it out loud. So, uh, you know, they're gathered and, and they see the, uh, uh, the ridiculous picture of, of this guy on the back of the book that my wife somehow approved that, that picture. Uh, she said it looked, uh, authorly or, or something. Um, and then they see me walk in w with my tie and uh, maybe I should just stop wearing ties in general, but, uh, and my big chin and, and uh, you know, just kind of scowling and waiting for me to tell them to don't do drugs and stay off the street and, uh, <clears throat> um, and uh, when they, it's not always smooth, I'm not saying that, but uh, when we get to a place where they see uh, I'm just a storyteller and, and I'm just there to uh, talk about their stories and, and talk about relationships and talk about mothers and and fathers and, and friends and, and conflicts and 
loyalty and doubts. And uh, if we get to that place, which doesn't happen every time, talk about love, not just the, uh, the grace and, and those aspects, but uh, the hard ones, the, the warped logic and the invisible burdens and the impossible loyalty that love engenders. Uh, it's pretty raw, I think pretty meaningful. Um, and the commonality of, of so many spaces is that there is something about Rob and his story that uh, compels or maybe empowers young people to share their own stories, fragments of, either through uh, the form of question or the response to a classmate's question or just a standalone testimony. And uh, maybe a lot of you probably know it, it is astonishing to witness a young person, particularly a young man, assume the vulnerability required to, to share their story and, and stand there and say, this is me now. Tell me about you. Uh, to stand and just talk and then just listen and pay attention. Uh, it's astonishing, but it's not that surprising because this was Rob Peace's gift. Um, as a teacher and as a friend was using his own experiences to improve the experiences of uh, anybody around him. If you had a story, he wanted to hear it. Uh, you wanted to laugh and uh, make fun of you and also counsel you uh, and to be there for you and to make you feel uh, safe and unjudged and unalone. Uh, so going back to uh, some of the questions that, uh, again, I, I still struggle with them. Uh, uh, it's sometimes easy to think that I, if Rob could see those groups and, uh, and maybe, maybe uh, feel like or hear from a teacher that, uh, that sharing his story had uh, helped some kids communicate and, and maybe altered a life, maybe even saved a life, maybe spared a mother the grief of his own, uh, that, that, he, uh, that he would be pretty glad about it. Uh, maybe he'd even get a kick out of the fact that uh, uh, I'm the one who did it. Um, he'd still be pissed off at me, but uh, he might come around. And, uh, and maybe that's justice for Rob Peace. Uh, to that student at Hampton University, uh, I mentioned, uh, again, after I, I stammered idiotically for, for a little bit, uh, um, I ended up talking to a friend of Rob's who, who uh, was from where Rob was from and went to Yale as well and, and struggled, just like Rob struggled and, and um, struggled even worse and drugs and, and chaos and everything. And uh, uh, unlike Rob, he did ask for help at a certain point and he went to med school and now he counsels traumatized teenagers in the South Bronx uh, physically traumatized, and uh, uh, he wouldn't be doing that very important work, and he wouldn't be married to a very good woman, and he wouldn't be uh, expecting his uh, first daughter in a couple of weeks from now, uh, if not for his friendship with Rob. By his own account, if not for his friendship with Rob, he would be dead. Uh, and so to that student, I, I just said, it's not just our own baggage and, and stress and the meaning of words to ourselves. It's how we impact uh, all the people whose paths we cross, uh, especially in school when we're young. Um, and he nodded, uh, I don't know, I think he heard me. We had a conversation 
later. Uh, I, I, was, I wasn't totally satisfied with my answer. Maybe it seemed a little trite or uh, insufficient, but most of my answers do. Uh, and uh, there are not really any answers in this story. Uh, I can't really tell you what the point is. Um, people get mad at me about that. They, they want me to indict Yale or racism or poverty or, or drugs or, or, uh, uh, or just rob himself and personal accountability. And of course, um, of course Rob made some bad decisions. He was smart enough to know better. He was loving enough to know the impact it would have on his loved ones if the worst happened. And the worst did happen. Um, but underneath all that, Rob was also just this guy, uh, not famous or anything. Uh, he certainly would never call himself notable. He was just this, like most people, a pretty special, complicated, and flawed guy living life, making decisions, most of them innocuous decisions, uh, trying to make sense of the world as it unfolded, uh, trying to sustain his vision for how he wanted to inhabit that world. Uh, people can argue over that vision. I would call it a romantic vision. Um, uh, romance being pretty vital, I, I think, to life. And, and if, you, if you read a lot of books or uh, Jackie Collins or if you've just ever been in love, uh, uh, I think you know it's vitality and, and we also know that uh, it doesn't always end well. But uh, it's that guy who his mother misses, this guy who, uh, you know, he didn't live in two worlds. He wasn't two people, he, he was one person. I, I lived in a small space with him and I can attest to, uh, to that. He mainly just liked to eat and sit around and listen to stories. Um, he aspired for a life that avoided the harried, financially based nature of, of a lot of lives that he observed, uh, a life that contained some kind of peace to it. Uh, and he ended up mired in the most harried, financially based, unpeaceful occupation there is. Um, and he died violently and pointlessly and painfully. Uh, left his mother with the only consolation she's ever expressed to me, which is just that he, he influenced a lot of people. Um, and he influenced me. It's nice to think that he might have influenced a few of you. And uh, as I begin, I just thank all of you for being here and for uh, your good work and, and your future service and, uh, and the influence and the impact that uh, a lot of you will have in the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and I'm sorry, I think I, I might have droned on a little bit long, which I apologize for, but uh, uh, um, if anybody has questions. So we may have time for two to three questions. So um, there's one mic over here and one mic over here. So about three questions. <coughs> uh, sir? Uh, I don't need a mic. Uh, no, you don't. Creating work for the outside world, essentially. 
Uh, well, well, thank you for, for your question and, uh, and your kind words. Um, and I, I learned a lot, which I, I tried to uh, suggest. I, I learned just uh, what a oblivious 19, 20, 20 year old person I was. Um, and even, and I mean, someone asked me this afternoon, uh, a question akin to that, and uh, and sort of my awareness going into this project, and, and uh, uh, you know, I, I thought I was pretty aware of, of uh, the macro sort of ills of society, and also the 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 way people are, and um, I, I learned how much I wasn't, uh, and in just. Uh, you know, spending, this is going to sound very kumbaya, but, but just spending a, a whole lot of time as the uh, conduit, not just for a whole lot of people's grief and, and their regrets and, and uh, their guilt, uh, but, but also their, their, their love and their joy. Uh, um, it just made me sort of love people more, and it definitely made me more of a crier. Uh, um, can you just tell us about the first time you met Rob? Like, the moment you met him? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I, so I met him, I talked to him on the, on the phone like a, a pre-move-in talk that uh, I would describe it as a maladroit. Uh, and, uh, you know, when we met, you know, it was cordial, but uh, we're both actually real quiet guys, quiet in different ways. I'm like a very wussy quiet, and Rob was sort of a very overbearing quiet. Um, um, so I think we actually, at least I kept my distance for, for, uh, for a bit. Um, I think I was, uh, hyper aware of, of maybe assumptions he would make about me, uh, most of which would be accurate assumptions. Um, and I, I sort of wanted to uh, to show him that I, I, I was cool. Uh, so, uh, thank you. Thank you for the book. Um, and I actually got here a little late. I had trouble finding the auditorium. But um, when I heard you were going to be here, really meant a lot to me. And I'll just tell you briefly my story. Um, I um, grew up in Patterson, New Jersey. Um, and when I got into Princeton University, my father was incarcerated at the time. I went on to um, go to medical school. And in the process, while I was in, at Harvard Medical School, I went home to visit and was almost killed. In a, act of gang violence. And when I read the book, I read this story that was so much like my life. And I remember one thing about my life, and this is a question I have for you about Rob. When I went to school at Princeton, every meal was taken care of. All I had to do was study. I didn't have to worry about someone trying to hurt me. I didn't have to worry about violence. I didn't have to worry about all the other stressors in the street. And the one thing that I was like my biggest motivation was actually not to go back. And it wasn't that I didn't love my home because it was always a part of me and I always took it with me. But being away was 
was so different. I think perhaps the difference between me and him was that my father got out of prison and he wouldn't let me come back. But I will say to you, I still don't understand from reading your book and I'd like to hear from your opinion. What do you think it was that made him go back? I know he had a, other alternatives. What do you think it was that made him go back? Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, and like, like I said, the, the value of maybe this whole thing to me is uh, stories. And I can't really answer that because I, I try just not, not to presume to know what was in his head. Uh, so you, you might have a better knowledge than I do. Um, but uh, I'll say that uh, he went back like all the time throughout college, like every couple weeks, uh, partly to sort of re-up his, his, um, his weed. Um, um, also just to check in with, with, with uh, his family and his friends and, and this, this super robust orbit of uh, people he had. Um, so I don't know if he ever felt like he left, maybe. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's easy to get into the narrative of, of, you know, narratives that exist for a reason but lack the nuance that real life holds of sort of being drawn back by, by uh, old loyalties. Uh, I'll just say that uh, something his mother told me recently recently, meaning like a year and a half ago or, or so. Um, and even something some of his friends have expressed to me um, in retrospect uh, is that what his mother said is her greatest regret is that she was never able to uh, express to Rob that she didn't need him around, she didn't need his he didn't end up get her a house. She owned her house. She had a job. Uh, his friends all had jobs. They liked having him around, but but uh, nobody needed him there. Um, and they felt he was always sort of motivated by other people's need of him um, as the one who you know could help you out with rent and give you advice on your job and uh, uh, you know, a, a pattern where people like me who know him at Yale uh, and observed his choices felt like we couldn't give him advice because he'd overcome so much more to be there. Uh, people back home, even people he'd known since third or fourth grade felt like they couldn't give him advice because he was always the smart one who sort of pulled them through school and had gone to Yale. So uh, uh, sort of living in a, in a vacuum of counsel, if that makes sense. Uh, I, I, you know, we all come back to that a lot. Um, also with the understanding that he, he didn't listen very well if uh, he didn't like what you were saying. Um, so, I don't, so I don't know if I can answer your, your question, but uh, uh, maybe some elements to think about. Uh, but thank you. Um, and and uh, again, I'm so sorry, I, I sort of went over time, but uh, it means a whole lot and uh, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thanks.
Thank you again, Jeff. We really appreciate you being here and sharing such a moving and really personal story. Really appreciate you being here with us tonight. Um, I want to now invite you all to join us for a reception in the multipurpose room, it's room 237 East. Um, Jeff will be available to sign your copies of his book. We have tons of food. Um, the easiest way to get there is to exit up and to the right, um, but there's also an elevator on the first floor right where you entered. Um, I hope you'll stay connected with us um, and look out for future events. Thanks to you all for being here tonight. <laughs>